hello welcome to the second session of second section of kendraj economics festival uh, ho hosted by kendraj economics club funded by global pluralistic economics training program here we have the second speaker uh, and hardcore marxian economics uh, scholar ankit singh with us or may i in invite akshay to introduce ankit to us good evening all how all of you are doing well and like about the speaker ankit singh is a recent graduate student at jawaharlal nehru university and is currently working as a systemic change executive at safe in india foundation and a researcher at stanford ca he has previously worked as a research assistant with chin trees and kritika khera at delhi school of economics and with dr tanushri goel at university of oxford uk with much pride and on behalf of kendraj economics club i welcome you to the event thank you thank you uh we'll have ankit speaking for the uh, first 15 minutes um kindly keep on dropping your questions i uh, will take up those in the last 10 minutes um also if any questions goes unanswered during the session uh you will share the email address of ankit with you so that like you can directly uh, email him the questions or or else via us you can reach out to him thank you uh, ankit kindly proceed thank you thank you first of all thank you so much for inviting me here um to talk about one of the most uh, pressing topics in uh, uh, like in economic theory or uh, in social sciences as whole uh, about the contemporary relevance of marxian political economy i would also like to thank uh, everyone who has joined uh, online and uh, uh, yes please feel free to uh, ask any questions you have in the chat box and i'll try to take as many questions as i can so uh, yeah i was just talking to uh, vinayakan and akshay about this topic of how contemporary relevance of marxian economy um, is sort of challenging because uh, the relevance itself has a huge scope and to deliver a lecture in such a short span of time of 50 minutes is a challenge in itself so uh, i'll just start by what are some of the topics you should expect coming up in this session so uh, we will discuss long and short of capitalism in 21st century and attempt on decoding the transnational capitalism and its impact on the so called development of the global south uh methodology of marxian political economy uh largely historical materialism the scientific theory of it then the perspectives on labor uh, how the how the price of labor power is determined which is uh, uh, which is which which is wages and the related concepts on labor like uh, reserve army of labor and uh, um and about accumulation primitive accumulation then we'll talk about the fictional precariat a class in making or weakening of the movement of uh, uh, the classic workers of the world unite and discussing the embouchement of the proletarian vanguard uh, following which we'll discuss hegemony in 21st century um, and but in particularly we'll discuss about enslavement of wage laborers and then any other topics that uh, might uh, come up in this discussion we will just uh, quickly discuss that so i'll start with uh, uh, essentially uh, building the framework of uh, uh, how the capitalism the stages of capitalism progressed and then uh, moving to the contemporary times so in the first uh, topic which is capitalism in 21st century decoding the transnational capitalism and impact on the under development of the global south um so before delving into the discussion of transnational capitalism i hope i am audible uh, yeah 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 so before delving in the discussion of uh, transnational capitalism which we will in great detail it is important to theorize the distinction between what we call the liberal state and the welfare state in a capitalistic framework so the basis of distinction on the assumption um on the assumption of political economy framework is that according to political economy framework class contradictions are inherent and unavoidable in the economy machinery so uh, you may refer to the communist manifesto where the conceptualization of the terms bourgeoisie and proletariat are elaborated 
so uh, both these classes are in constant contradictions uh, and in this respect we will attempt to uh, distinguish uh, the liberal state and the welfare state so therefore in a liberal state the class contradictions in capitalism are automatically resolved through economic growth which is maximized under a laissez faire economy what we call a free market economy which uh, encourages competition and innovation so this is this calls for a minimal role of the state so to be particular um, a state only intervenes to protect the property rights enforcement of contracts and minimal social safety nets as required for the poor however in the welfare state mechanism the class contradictions in capitalism needs to be stabilized by the state so uh, usually this uh, stabilizing is done through a capital labor accord so the state uh, will ensure productivity uh, growth and competitiveness um, as well as redistribution of the working class resulting economic gains thus facilitating raising profits for the capitalist and rising well-being of the workers now the conception of a welfare state in keynesian in keynesian economics invites government spending to increase the demand in the economy which is beyond the orthodoxy of what we know uh, a supply side approach so the development of uh, this model of welfare state is what we call the kfb model which is keynesian fordist beverage model so i won't be explaining keynesian economy in detail but uh, i'll attempt to decode this aspect of welfare state further so the economy machinery was guided by regulated economic policies and principles uh, which is situated in the ideas of keynesian economics the production however in particular follows a fordist regime so during fordism the mass production of commodities take place which is done in an assembly line uh, assembly line setup so labor is relatively better off than the current uh, the current ongoing era of post fordism where we can see informalization and contractualization nearing their peaks and labor is unable to do social reproduction um and hiring and firing mechanisms are typical so a uh, uh this is the, the fordist regime that i'm talking about in the welfare state beverage which is the b in the kfb model comes from the name of uh, sir william beverage who played a central role in designing uh, the british welfare state so his 1942 report social insurance and elite services also known as beverage report served as the basis of the welfare state put in place by the labor government elected in 1945 so beverage work uh was largely theorizing the importance of uh, social security benefits for the workers in the economy during the welfare state so together if you see keynesian fordist and beverage together they become uh, what we call the welfare state model now uh, in addition to this economic framework the politics on justice uh during that welfare state is very interesting so with, it was largely rawlsian the political theory of justice by john rawls so i'm not going to discuss rawls in great detail what i'm trying to emphasize on is the implementation of rawlsian political theory in the welfare state framework so keynesian phase has to be seen in parallel with the increasing emphasis on the social democracy so ideas like social safety nets for poor were propagated which uh, from a marxian perspective can be seen as an attempt to strengthen the struggle of the worker because for for a proletariat it is important to survive to struggle however these policies of welfare state is not complete for the revolutionary goal to be achieved that we just mentioned workers of the world to unite because collectivization has taken a back seat in the framework now these are merely reformist policies and welfare state is a reformist approach to curb down some of the crises of capitalism now the conceptualization of welfare state happened during keynes era before that uh, we already had one of the major crises of capitalism um and till till date we have had several crises a crisis of capitalism however just after the end of this kfb uh, model after the end of the welfare state with the oil uh, oil shock and the reinterpretation of the orthodoxy economics and in the name of uh, free market or laissez faire theories of neoliberalism were written down 
So uh, Mises started long back and uh, some of his work were credited by Hayek. Back then he was in LSE and later moved to U Chicago. Nonetheless, the principle was largely situated on the grounds of social Darwinism, a reimagination of Darwin's theory in a social setting, which was the survival of the fittest. Under the framework of market-led economy, which has failed multiple times, the neoliberalism continues to flourish because it serves the interests of the bourgeoisies, which are the capitalists. Sometimes around the advent of neoliberalism, the post-Fordist era of production started, and this era was largely characterized by the term what we call flexible specialization. So what is flexible specialization? Flexible specialization is a new Smithian approach to post Fordist, uh, which believes in this fundamental change in the international economy, uh, like around this period of uh, oil shock 1970s which forced the firms to switch from mass production to a, a, a different sort of production regime, which involved flexible specialization. So instead of producing generic goods, firms now uh, found it more profitable to uh, produce diverse products, uh, uh, like produce diverse products targeted on different uh, group of customers. So uh, appealing to this, their sense of taste, fashion, and investing a huge amount of money on the mass production of a single product. So uh, firms now needed to build an intelligent system of labor and the machine, uh, which were flexible and could quickly respond to the whims of the market. So by flexible, we mean this sort of flexible. And the technology, uh, which made adjustments simple and inexpensive, uh, making a smaller specialized production runs um, economically feasible. So uh, this technology helped in uh, gaining, uh, gaining the economic benefits out of the production process. So flexibility and skill, uh, particularly in the context of labor, uh, is also very crucial to understand. The workforce was now divided into what we call a skill flexible core and a time flexible periphery. So flexibility and variety in the uh, skills and knowledge of the core workers and the machine for the production um, allowed for uh, specialized production of the goods. So modern just-in-time manufacturing, what we have heard uh, even in the industrial spaces, uh, is just like one of the examples of flexible uh, approach of production. So uh, likewise, uh, the production structure began to change on the sectoral level. So instead of a single um, single firm manning the assembly line in the Fordist era, which was the assembly line production from raw materials to the finished products, the production process became fragmented uh, as individual firms specialized on their areas of expertise. So now if you, if you see automobile industries in particular, um, I can give you an example in Manasi because that's where uh, largely my work is situated in. Uh, you will find few uh, tiers producing just a specific kind of uh, automobile parts. So there, there are tier, tier one, tier two, tier three, tier four, all connected in this assembly line production with the OEMs. And um, so, in each, uh, so the, the raw materials are assembled maybe in tier one or in the OEM branch. So for Maruti Suzuki, it would be Maruti Suzuki plant. But suppose a door, a door comes from tier two. Some parts of that door is manufactured in tier two or in, in tier one or uh, in, in tier three or in tier four. So largely particular uh, firms have specialized in their own commodities production, what we call as a Marshallian firm. So a firm which is specialized in one commodity production is called a Marshallian firm, which follows a Marshallian principle. This name has, uh, is again from uh, Alfred Marshall, who was uh, an orthodox neo neoclassical economic. So uh, like the production structure that we were talking about became uh, more sort of like fragmented um, at an individual firm level, specializing in their own areas of expertise. And as an evidence for this theory of specialization, proponents claim uh, that Marshallian industrial districts or cluster of firms uh, uh, got established. So uh, a place where all these Marshallian firms were located came to be known as these industrial districts. And one of such districts is the example that I just gave, um, this Gurgaon Manesar Faridabad belt, um, 
um, of automobile industrial districts. So similar districts were seen during that phase um, in in Jutland, in Italy, in Silicon Valley, etc. So in the contemporary times, this flexibilization of labor process has resulted in hiring and firing mechanisms and huge amount of contractualization. So around the globe, uh, free market attempts to globalize uh, has related has resulted in this unequal distribution of resources between the global north and global south. So I bring forward uh, some of these. Uh, I bring forward this study of um, um, this multinational corporation done by Stephen Heimer to uh, explain this contemporary relevance of Marxian political economy in the context of how transnational corporation works and how, because of transnational corporation, this unequal distribution of resources uh, has started. So this is the first part of this discussion following which we will talk more about how Marxian uh, political economy framework is designed as a whole. So, uh, yeah, so I'll move forward with the discussion on multinational corporation. Uh, so this intellectual work, which was done by Stephen Heimer, was largely to criticize the contemporary capit capitalism in the neoliberal world, where multinational corporations emerged as exploitative capitalists, hindering the process of uh, growth of uh, underdeveloped countries. So his seminal work basically had this objective to understand the political economy of foreign direct investments made by the multinational corporations and distinction of direct and portfolio investment. So these uh, largely shed lights on uh, uh, largely shed light on the large multinational corporation with strong communication channel and vertically and horizontally integrated structure, which would function. Uh, which would function transnationally and uh, accumulate resources uh, from the underdeveloped countries, thereby exploiting it. So he basically chose to radically diverge, like divert from the neoclassical work of economics and use a Marxist uh, approach to study uh, some of these, uh, uh, what we basically call unanswered, like till then it was unanswered uh, uh, theories of international trade and forms. So um, Heimer framed his argument on the grounds uh, of uh, economists uh, named Chandler and Reach uh, on different levels of uh, business administration and their roles um, and their roles part partially distinguishing uh, the changes which were brought in during the evolution of corporate capital from this idea of Marshallian firm that we just discussed to national corporations. So how from port uh, from post Fordist era, where uh, Marshallian firms were established and industrial districts were present, we moved to a framework where capital is being more, uh, you know, uh, more foreign, more international. So to understand the whole idea of national corporation and uh, furthering it to the multinational corporation is something what uh, Heimer studied, and this is where we uh, and not just Mar Marxists even. Um, even social democrats believe that uh, largely social uh, you know uh, exploitation uh, is happening in the countries of global south so this distinction is not merely restricted by the terms of geographical locations however like this is the major um, important aspect like although we are saying that it's not on the basis of geographical location it, is, it was always global south which had to face a lot of uh, uh, these atrocities, economic atrocities laid down by the global north. We see economists literally denying uh, co colonization and uh, let alone like talking about uh, uh, imperialism. So um, it is very important to uh, also see it beyond a geographical location. Um, however, it is, it is the subject to factors like administrative strength to command uh, branch plants uh, along with level two, level three for these multinational corporations. So you will often find a multinational corporation's headquarters at, uh, say, New York. So Goldman Sachs is at New York. And it, it's uh, uh, plants like tier two plants, tier three plants are across Global South. And that's how they are administrating it. So there's a strong administrative strength, which are commanding these branch plants uh, in, in these lower levels. And uh, this is largely happening because of e effective communication channel. 
and feasibility to take credit or financial capability to diversify and invest uh, in uh, uh, in in generating a higher fictitious capital for the concentration of capital and uh, to keep this accumulation process ongoing from the global south so uh, largely uh, what these multinational corporations do or how they function is they compete uh, to form a monopoly and hegemonically dominate the market by eliminating other competitors either through forcing them to shut down or through practices like mergers and acquisitions or being the dominant player in the um, in the uh, uh, what we call as uh, oligopolistic cartels so uh, all these firms have their basic uh, uh, goal to be uh, expropriating profit at a huge extent and that can only be possible if they are uh, forming uh, strong cartels in an olig- oligopolistic framework or uh, expropriating monopolistic uh, um, profits monopolist power profits so uh, for the establishment of these mncs the following con- conditions should be met so first uh, there should be liberalizing uh, what we call constraints on the foreign exchange markets so financing under development countries governments capital expenditure for enhancing the labor quality and to skill them as as per the requirements of branch plan finding solution to the urban food problem and population growth in developing countries so these are like few of the strategies that we adopt for the uh, um, for understanding how a multinational corporation is transcending its uh, uh, how how the under development is basically trans, um, is basically uh, trickling down um, so i'll just repeat these points again i i just quickly uh read it so these points were liberating uh, constraints on the foreign exchange markets financing the under development uh, countries governments um then uh yeah um enhancing the labor quality and the uh, skills that were required uh, for these bl- branch plant managers or the people who are working there and finding solutions to the urban food problem and population growth for developing countries so basically to uh, uh go through these preconditions and uh, establish the mncs is the, one of the initial steps of how a multinational corporation functions in a in a global south setup so um, hymer's conceptualization of a multinational corporation has to have the following features so there has to be a well structured hierarchy in the division of labor of the firm of the firm uh, functioning in uneven geographical locations where level 3 is engaged with the production activities so level 3 are those firms which are situated in global south they 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 are mostly engaging with production activities and located in branch units globally um, subject to the state's regulation um then you will see tax patterns cost of production in the branch plant countries so these are the initial steps level 2 uh, just after the level uh, level 3 governs the operationalization of its subordinates are located in relatively high geographical concentrated areas so you will see uh, um some some branch plant uh, located in a, a deserted area uh, carrying forward the production process from there and then there will be uh, headquarters say in capital uh, in capital cities so in in delhi there might be one in um, in bangalore there might be one so from there uh, they are trying to operationalize the uh, entire production uh, uh, system uh, so they constitute of level 2 um, level 2 firms and level 1 or the or the corporate brain is located in a densely uh, concentrated area so usually we see it in the home country of these uh, multinational organizations so new york boston so it has uh, access to capital markets better professionals as employees and effective administrations so uh, how the labor market is segmented as per the requirements of this uh, um, multinational corporation uh, and the structure of the work- workforce so that is interesting to note and finally a large pool of uh, fictitious capital will be present to invest for the primitive accumulation and fdi and keep this process of concentration of capital and centralization of capital what marx mentions in um, in volume 3 of capital 
for the instance of stabili- uh, establishing an oligopolistic cartels with in uh, with usually uh, capitalists in the uh, in the global south so you will see um, foreign con- foreign companies trying to have uh, co- trying to sit on the same table with the indian capitalists and uh, forming and making negotiations and dividing uh, profits and shares so largely such kind of activities take place uh, with and usually this all happen in a cartel framework of oligopolistic competition requires financial strength to gain trades from the uh, to uh, to to gain uh, to gain profits from these trades and these features are very much closely related to the factors like um, like the law of unequal development and some of the features explaining the regional disparity between the global north and global south because if a multinational corporation is establishing their branch uh, branch plant level 3 in a, in a geographical deserted areas and level 2 uh, in a uh, relatively more uh, uh, economically st- uh, stronger cities there is obviously this kind of regional distribution uh, r- regional distinction that is occurring and uh, this will always uh, move from the uh, move from the goods market from the production market to the labor market and within from the labor market as well you will find different kind of uh, um, different kind of uh, labor being asked for so uh, in some places they will mostly hire contractual workers informal workers in other places they will go for a, a relatively more uh, a relatively more uh, um, trained and skilled workers but definitely like level 1 workers will be uh, high, will be more professional as an employee and effective administrator for these mncs uh, and and that's where they target so these features are closely related uh, to this uh, whole idea of what we just talked about law of unequal dis- development and multinational corporations are exploiting at at different levels uh, of their expansion and intensifying inequality internationally so application of the of what we call the location theory um concludes that the geographical specializations will strengthen this hierarchy in decision making so just based on this these geographical locations these decisions are uh, um, being made and affecting the structure of the income and consumption in the economy so through the process of trickle down effect from a capital city situated in a developed countries mostly in the global north to the branches located globally majority in the global south via its marketing channel so this sort of creates an inequality of status and capability to experiment between a resident of a developed nation and a resident of an underdeveloped nation uh, as a former is definitely higher in the chain of a two stage uh, market because of their higher income so obviously someone who is employed in level 1 will have different demands uh, then someone who is employed in the lower levels so based on these demands these companies produce and that's where this whole idea of flexible specialization is coming up that i just mentioned so in the branch plant countries located in the southern region the firms hinder the process of um, infrastructural development by messing up the uh, government expenditure for the growth so precisely by avoiding tax burden so usually you will find nexus between these corporates and the state to uh, facilitate these infrastructural development which is not related to the welfare mode what uh, uh, what and how it should be for a de- uh, for a welfare state but it's largely um, on uh, aspects of uh, um, um, expropriating corporate profits through avoiding tax burdens so for a multinational corporation the establishment is relatively more straight forward where the tax regime for these firms to operate is not uh, stringent so the process of avoiding these tax burdens start with uh, something as simple as um, manipulating the transfer prices or shifting the production process or through international organizations terms and conditions so through these uh, these uh, ways they try to maneuver and uh, expropriate profit um, and and try to maintain the the ongoing underdevelopment um, and try to maintain this underdevelopment in the global south so nonetheless these mncs are uh, charged based on profits generated by ex- exploiting underdeveloped countries resources in their home countries where the 
where the corporate brain is usually located, right? So this consequences of the same would be fewer development activities in the underdeveloped countries because of less tax uh, revenue, and thereby all these mechanisms affecting the Keynesian ways of stabilizing the economy by lowering the effectiveness of the demand policies. Higher FDIs for pe- perpetual penetration in such countries would make country further dependent. on this whole idea of a market mechanism on on this whole new liberal setting so as a consequence of mnc's expansion the political cultural and legal sovereignty as a whole of an economic uh, nation along with the economic identity of course of the underdeveloped uh, countries are affected and this thereby restrains the national independence and leaving them at the mercy of the developed countries so the branch plant countries in the global south face the expansion of regional disparity poverty rising unemployment foreign exchange crisis and inclusion of these countries in global crisis because of liberalization of foreign trade so the multinational companies sustain economic profit through continual accumulation maintaining a huge reserve army of labor that we will discuss um, very soon and uh, generating more considerable surplus value at the cost of development of these underdevelopment uh, of these underdeveloped countries so this regional disparity between the uh, global north and global south is thus amplified by the existence and the survival of the multinational corporations so uh, till now we have discussed some of the uh, stages of the capitalistic development uh where we are currently um and then uh, how this under development has tran- transcends and everything about the multinational corporation that we needed to know and how uh, they can um uh facilitate this process of under development for the global south now um, i'll just quickly discuss some of the perspectives on labor um which uh, largely includes determining the prices of the labor power and related concepts of uh, uh, reserve army of labor so um uh, yeah i just i just spoke about class contradiction between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat so there is a a capitalist who has a primary motive to expand the surplus value and further use it to employ more capital in a profitable business employment which would increase the rate of accumulation so with this higher surplus being capitalized the demand for the labor power will rise and the surplus population would be employed followed by the increase in their wages so it is to be noted that an increase in the wages is subject to the constraints of the gains that the capitalist fetches so if a capitalist will require to accumulate more they might uh, need to ch- make few changes in the process of uh, hiring or hiring or firing the labor so this aspect of employment is very much related to uh, the constraints of the gains that capitalists fetch so in any situation if a capitalist feels that a rise in wage is affecting their gains they would immediately reduce the amount of investment made on capital out of the surplus value so uh, if the gain is getting increased the amount of investment on a capital is getting reduced and that is being made up by the wages of the workers so uh, is merely uh, and then this this whole aspect of the rate of accumulation is uh, is nothing but uh, is merely a dependent variable on uh, on the capitalistic uh, interest of uh, expropriating profit so marx rejected this idea of blaming the wage rise for the crisis what what we keep on hearing the logic of inflation uh, for the crisis um, for instance like a stagflation on the on this ground for like i'll just give you an instance like stagflation on this ground um, largely uh, the the cause was not directly linked to the wage rise right so workers are expected uh, to work equally hard and produce high surplus value irrespective of their change in the wage, wages due to this uh, primitive accumulation because of inherent worker uh, capitalistic worker relationship so uh, marx largely disagreed on the uh, views of malthus about natural law of population and poverty and the former and the former blamed the capitalistic system uh, for this uh, approach of perpetuating the expanding surplus value through primitive accumulation and expanding gains leaving some of the workers unemployed in the reserve um, in the in in this reserve army of labor so this 
existence of a race between capitalist to accumulate more and invest in surplus value for capital generation was pointed out by marx so in this race of higher accumulation of capital the capitalists who will convert the higher surplus value in investments to expand their individual wealth would be capturing more market and will have higher monopoly power so this expansion of capital can be done either through either you can diversify in different project uh, production lines what we call as concentration of capital or you can uh, form cartels or merge on accumulate what we uh, largely talk about uh, in marx and discourse uh, a centralization of capital so in the case of mnc's we just discussed how mnc's function uh, in in both these regards in 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 um, by practicing the concentration of capital as well as by merging and acquisitions uh, in in the centralization process so this diversification requires a huge investment that is made through higher surplus value and uh, the concentration of capital is a process of investing accumulated wealth for further surplus extraction and uh, uh, persistent accumulation so the capitalists around the world um, like are in this process of accumulating wealth and to establish their dominance they need to uh compete with each other and other small producers globally to be successfully dominant in this global market the industrial capitalists would require to have a higher monopoly power so in this process they will suppress and sort of like what we call kill other capitalists either through hegemonic control or or through forcing them to shut down their operations so this process of eliminating capitalists expanding their dominance and gaining control of the large markets is what we call centralization of capital so through this process of centralization uh, there are examples of mergers and acquisitions and both these process um, require huge surplus to start with and sustain so hence the persistent source of surplus extraction is by reducing the wages of labor through making her work for the longer hours um through the concentration of capital the industrial capitalists employ often more like more often employ machineries and less labor thereby increasing the proportion of constant capital uh, relative to the variable capital so this mechanism of reducing the cost through paying wages and investing machines for mass production put uh, uh, puts the entire uh, um what we call reserve army of labor out of the employment so the surplus in the army of labor is then a part of existing uh, industrial reserve army of labor hence with this high accumulation of wealth the industrial reserve of uh, reserve army of labor uh, con- like is persistently increasing so this industrial reserve army is not merely a consequence of this accumulation process but eventually even a condition for hi- higher accumulation process so now um, as a capitalist you can just imagine that you have a hired few um, a few workers and uh, you are paying them less so, th- so obviously few workers will tend to move out from that employment uh, so those workers will form a reserve army of labor now when you will require a job you will um, when you, when you will require um, uh, when you will require to uh, diversify or produce more you will require you, uh, you will require workforce and for that you have this industrial reserve army in place from where you can negotiate and uh, not often negotiate it's largely uh, it's largely the precarity of the workers that they often agree to work at less uh, wage wages so this precarity is also uh, coming from this whole idea of uh, concentration and uh, uh, basically centralization of capital so uh, does the process of liberating markets and stabil- um, est- establishing the uh, monopoly control through primitive accumulation and reserve army of labor which in turn guides the sole aim of the capitalists that is investing and generating higher surplus value and in this process it discounts the misery and high rate of exploitation and brutality that uh, employed labor and an industrial army of labor suffers so uh, this is uh, a brief idea about how this industrial army of labor functions but if you see as an economy uh, like a, a economy as a whole uh, this reserve army of labor and the labor which is employed both faces this issue of what we call segmentation of workforce so this whole workforce that is 
uh, already in the company and the workforce which is outside the company um, industrial army of labor both these workforce are hugely segmented and this segmentation uh, not only hinders the process of collectivization but also increases the scope of accumulation for the capitalist by by uh, differential treatment or wages um, so i'll just explain briefly what is this labor market segmentation that we are talking about in marxian framework so the informalization and migration have uh, created new forms of labor market segmentation so in which the members of the most vulnerable communities and groups are usually placed at the bottom and are mostly given filthy and risky work so this uh, yeah. uh, that, uh, we have only 10 more minutes uh, yeah. yeah yeah i'll just try to quickly sum up so i'm just uh, discussing only uh, the points that i feel is more important to be discussed so i'll just try to quickly sum up so the process of this segmentation of labor markets in both uh, urban and rural areas traces back to the continual primitive accumulation in the rural economy so the workers belonging from the rural areas traces uh, belonging from the rural area usually moves to urban spaces looking for opportunities to work because they were dispossessed of their livelihoods so the marginal farmers who were uh, what we call uh, proletarianized were left with no uh, operational holdings and thus they become a part of this massive reserve army of labor in the rural areas so uh, in the initial stages i gave you an example of how a ma massive reserve army in industrial spaces might look uh, something similar can also happen in rural areas where uh, these people are getting dispossessed from their livelihood and moving to the uh, urban spaces in search of job so most of these workers worked as con uh, as as casual laborers in the farm activities or opted for non farming activities so some of those who could not find a casual work um in the rural areas um were forced to move to the urban centers for the employment opportunities and these workers who moved to urban centers were surely marginal but most of them also belong to lower sections of the social hierarchy so the process of segmentation happens because of the subdivision of markets which is based on the differences in the working conditions for example um if there is a worker uh, who is belong who is who is coming from an upper caste family migrating from a rural area to an urban city might not be comfortable in being employed as a sanitation worker the market forces of the market forces or the growth of uh, capitalism has brought some of these major changes in segmentation and and has appropriated it largely so segmented labor is considered to be more beneficial for the capitalist interest so this segmentation of labor force will give give an edge to the capitalist to accumulate and further compete with other capitalists who might be using um, using the generalized labor market which do not see the segmentation in the labor market so the capitalists are following this what we call the low road um you know where the employment is being done informally through no contracts lower wages flexibilization and less cost and overall longer hours of work thereby exploiting workers more and expands their profit so this capitalist in this process uh, often resorts to adapting themselves to the social ins institutions that are in place and working in a legal framework that would help them easier with these uh, you know help help them go easier with these mechanisms of exploitation and profit extraction so economist kp kanan uh his study largely found that workers belonging from the marginalized sections were the ones who were forced to move out of the agriculture the two most significant groups were the scheduled castes and dalits so this finding was to support the historical argument he asserted that it was it, it was them who were denied lands to cultivation left landless and made to work as attached worker in agrarian society so these workers were subjected to harsh harsh exploitation from the upper caste rich uh, middle farmers and were forced to work at lower wages so the upper caste landlords were like the pre capitalists feudal uh, before the advent of capitalism particularly in the stage of feudalism and semi feudalism the state machinery largely disposes the labor of dalits and uh, adivasis from their common property land and natural resources and uh, um, to fulfill these needs of the state led industries forests were reduced um, 
merely to supply raw materials like timber firewood etc so the state largely restricted the entry of dalits adivasis and people from socially backward community in reserved forest and in in some forests the dalit and adivasi communities are, were not allowed to produce for their social reproduction needs as a result of which they were forced to become a part of this existential uh, um, they were forced to become part of this existing reserve army of labor in urban spaces so uh, the workers were hired from reserve army through contractors and middlemen who were largely discriminated and would find cheap labor and the capitalist that that the capitalists would require and uh, there will be a segmented labor market for farm and non farm activities as well so belonging on um, so whether you are belonging from a marginalized section or not so the workers from this specific segmented labor market would uh, have different demands for their wages so uh, particularly those who are belonging from the lower section will demand lower wages and capitalists in the race of accumulation would want to make more profit and hence will choose those workers over the general labor market workers so this non agricultural worker whose social reproduction was once dependent on this national uh, on on this uh, natural uh, resources uh, was dispossessed um, was dispossessed by the this machinery of capitalist by this nexus of capitalist and state on this basis of the production requirement um yeah and i'll very quickly discuss this aspect of hegemony which is the this final topic that we were supposed to discuss so um i did mention um about the fordist regime uh, in the initial phase of this discussion so to understand the discourse on the international labor market it is crucial to locate labor beyond the conception of a process in the international political economy framework so antonio gramsci brings out the um, economic uh, component of hegemonic rules which had to involve co- like consent um, along with dominance so a form of consent a, a form of consent along with dominance is how, how he saw fordism and how he described it in his chapter uh, americanism and fordism in the present notebook so for the establishment of this hegemonic regime the crucial functions of the economics for uh, like you say production consumption all were hegemonized and uh, i'm giving you an example of united states which was largely becoming a dominant uh, player around post war uh, uh, period right so they had to institutionalize their production mechanism and labor process which was known as uh, fordism is what we were talking about so this fordism as a labor process was uh, regulating and organizing work particularly during the golden phase of uh, capitalism what we call the golden era of capitalism and this uh, fordist process along with the welfare state notion ensuring social safety nets and social minimum uh, minimum welfare laid the foundation of this new model of capitalism uh, the reformist version of capitalism so the work uh, carried out in the form in the forms in the fordist regime was extensively uh, were extensive uh, extremely uh, intensive and uh, uh, monotonous so the products produced in these forms were uh, interchangeable unlike the post ford ford sort of which we discussed that the project uh, the products will be more specialized based on the kit needs and were produced in the assembly line so braverman henry braverman was a marx marxist uh, uh, sociologist he talks about uh, de-skilling of uh, workers so one worker performing just one job like screwing bolts arranging products in straight line so in a assembly line you often see like there will be one worker who is just screwing bolts and doing these kind of things these things often de-skill one worker so there would be one uh, so in previous era where there just used to be one worker who used to say uh, make uh, a pencil like all alone by himself the same pencil when it shifted to an assembly line resulted in different uh, you know different uh, forms of specialization what adam smith also talks about so overall this phase is to be seen as a idea of de-skilling and the task requires th- this constant physical and psychic efforts right so they uh, uh, so you always have this particular thing this is what you are supposed to do and and you can't make mistakes in a assembly line production so you have given a consent of being a part of it yet you have to you know go through all these um you have to let uh, let lose your uh, you have to basically go through all this pain uh, muscular pain and nervous uh, atrocities coming out from this uh, um 
this production mechanism. So this is where I locate hegemony. So this conception of hegemonic uh, regime is spread deep into the lives of the workers. It's two minutes I'll take. So deep in the life of the workers by affecting their uh, living standards, thinking process and experiences. So there were impacts seen on family structures and in the social milieus, which were traditionally rooted. So there were changes in the consumption pattern altogether, particularly of that worker who chose to continue uh, producing in a firm with uh, higher wages and better living standards. So those workers who spend their money on alcohol, recreational activities, these activities gave employer a discomfort, basically, to uh, discomfort of losing on their performance. So obviously there's a worker who is drinking and who is engaging in uh, recreational activities, which might be important for that worker's social reproduction, for him to come again next day to work, is seen as a discomfort and a loss of performance in the factories. To avoid this, the regime has to be uh, embedded in the virtues of uh, rational spending, purity, and this whole idea of pro- um, this whole idea of uh, prohibition of the working class. So, what is considered to be a uh, rational spending is conceptualized. What is considered to be a pure? So, you are not uh, supposed to drink alcohol or go whoring around because this production line is out there, w- which will get uh, impacted. So, these virtues were established with the help of the state's moral campaigns and regaining of the muscular and nervous uh, energy that we were talking about. So those workers who did not imbibe in these virtues eventually had to leave the firm and move to the periphery or unregulated sector. So this unregulated sector was the informal sector that we keep on hearing. And um, even, I mean, this this hegemony, you can see it in in, in families of during that time in, in the Fordist era. So a new female personality was altogether created. So which will be ideologically and morally focused emerged who looked for a husband who goes for, who, who goes to work and not do work, not do work, goes to work in terms of size of the family. The romanticized image of a small, happy family was uh, propagated by this movies during that era and where the husband was the breadwinner. And when he comes back to his full attention will be on the social reproduction, which definitely requires his consent, right? You can't just ask someone to go back and have fun and come again. So it involved his consent and his wife and children will be there to help him uh, physically or uh, uh, help in the process of uh, uh, regaining this labor power. So this intellectual supporting Fordism and calling it a golden phase are uh, failing to understand it as a social compromise because this aspect of hegemony is deeply rooted. So this enslavement, uh, this is the final thing that uh, the the last word that I mentioned in that uh, topic, the enslavement of wage labor. So this enslavement of the wage labor continued in all phases of capitalism. So before and after mercantile capitalism, in the reformist period of capitalism, during the Fordist period of hegemony that I described, and e- and and a lot more in the post Fordist regime, in the new new liberal regime that we are living in. And I mean, I can just assume like we we do see Uber drivers and uh, Ola drivers suffering. So a lot in the digital capitalistic framework as well. So however, in the recent time, the situation has become more precarious and which I'm, I'm, I'm definitely sure all of us keep hearing about. So that's where I'll end. Yeah, uh, while wondering all these relevant things, like we can see countries like Brazil uh, and other Latin American countries moving in the left direction. Uh, thank you so much, Ankita. It was kind of a wonderful. Uh, I mean, I, I'm sorry that we couldn't provide you much more time. Um, we have a few questions came up. Uh, Akshay, could you kindly read them out? Yeah, sure. I will read them out. Uh, so the first question from Anushka is that, like, can we make the reserve army of labor less precarious or how can we ensure better working conditions for them? Yeah, so it's, it's a very, very good question because this whole uh, uh, debate of social democracy versus what we call communism is inherent in this. Welfare state model, uh, how you locate this industrial reserve army of labor in a welfare state model was something that was missing in this topic and which which was raised in this question so a welfare in a welfare state model obviously there is a food uh, production line and everyone is working there so obviously um, employment is increasing and there is government spending right from the keynesian model so employment is increasing relatively 
less precarious situation than today flexible specialization right so um, welfare model had this aspect of uh, um, yeah welfare model had this aspect of uh, uh, social security benefits from coming from the beverage report which uh, included all these workers who were working in this manufacturing units to be a little more safer than they are in the, in this current time with a huge amount of flexibilization and contractualization i mean we are not even discussing about the workers who are uh, engaged engaged in the production process like all of us like most of us are working and um, we are not even talking about us we are talking about industrial reserve army of labor so we we are more precarious uh, in terms of uh, um, social security benefits that we were in the welfare time let alone the um, industrial reserve army of labor so one way i can see it is through implementing these policies kini uh, beverage policy policies in uh, in unorganized sector because these industrial reserve army of labor are largely engaged in the informal sector are largely working as a casual and contractual labor so if we can form uh, some policies uh, to strengthen their social um, to, to basically to uh, provide them social security benefits that will be um, really helpful uh, obviously and then we are talking about the, the, these whole debates on uh, uh, courts right and how these courts are uh, now going to talk about uh, unorganized wo- workers they are not even covering organized workers yet and we have just expanded to unorganized workers without uh, uh, you know realizing the full potential of these courts so yeah that's how okay. i see it it would be nice yeah. if you could brief with the next two answers so that like we are, we are slightly running out of time so uh, if you could uh, akshay could you read out the two more questions remaining yeah sure uh, like i will merge and read the two questions like i think that would be better yeah, uh, yeah. like first question by bodhi satwa would you kindly share some thoughts on the emergence of idea of gig economy the capitalism at the current context evolved with a general sense of liberation of workers and how a non partisan marxist position deals with it and the second question from uh, gower schuler uh, how do the big banks and their power of credit creation fit in the marxist picture yeah over to you angu right so uh, thoughts on the emergence of the idea of a gig economy in the capitalistic framework at the current context evolved with the general sense of liberation of the workers and how are not okay so uh, yeah gig economy obviously they uh, it's it's that stage in the capitalistic development where you have realized full specialization of production process and it's 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 largely flexible so uh, you the workers are not attached to the production uh, to the production process they are separated uh, a topic that uh, marxists keep on using is called alienation so alienation of uh, labor uh, is is huge in the gig economy framework where uh, that labor is being separated from the commodity and um, this particular commodity as in the sense of the service that is being provided uh, uh, in in these uh, platforms so platform economy as a whole is a space which is largely precarious and um, to see it as a sense of liberation is interesting but i would also see uh, it as a i mean you this sort of i mean i'm just just thinking about it uh, philosophically this idea of liberation is coming from this idea of choice so uh, whether you chose to be a, a platform economy worker or you had no other option to do anything other than platform economy worker or the platform economy worker was like among the top uh, options that you had uh, in this uh, in, in the list of things that you could do so i think when you analyze liberation you should measure it in those terms economically speaking and uh, i'm sure you won't be uh, seeing it as a liberation uh, of the workers in a platform economy setup it's just that they are uh, what we call uh, free to choose they are free to choose uh, but then they are not uh, not not uh, literally free <laughs> and uh, how do the big bank and their power of credit creation fit in the marxist framework so in this particular session i discussed how the multinational corporations use it uh the financial aspect of it you will mostly find in um uh, in the work of robert minsky and a few uh us uh, marxist which have largely covered uh how this banking and uh, imperialism imperialistic forces are being 
uh, you know, expropriating profits from the uh, global south. So uh, I don't have a lot of knowledge about this, but uh, in the particular session, what I uh, um, in this particular session, what I covered was how these transnational corporations uh, hinders this process of uh, uh, you know government spendings, and through uh, the idea of FDIs uh, en- engages in the uh, in the discussion uh, engages in the in the nexus of state and capitalism. And uh, puts the small businesses out of uh, put the small businesses uh, usually like e- either they merge or acquire or they just kill the capitalists. So uh, credit creation, not exactly I have answered that question, but uh, sort of an implication I I guess I have. Oh uh, yes, uh, thank you so much, Ankita. It was kind of a <laughs> we have, uh, we apologize for the shortage of time. Uh, but um thank you so much and kids for being here and sharing all the wonderful insights with us uh, in a brief uh, point of time and thank you all of you guys uh, for attending this session um there there are um, there are future sessions lined up our, our next session the third session will be on devaluation of rupee in 1966 um it will be by chair joshi that will be uh, examining the intellectual debates which was happening between kane raj and bhagwati Uh, so it is kind of a less explored area so i guess um it will be an interesting discussion for all of you guys to attend uh thank you once again for uh, joining us uh please uh please join us on 13th at 7 pm uh i ist or uh, 130 uh, pm utc uh see you there bye thank you ankit thank you thank you take care bye